Well, hello, dear listeners and watchers. Welcome to another episode of the Global Advocate Career Podcast. As you know, I'm doing a series on the career workplace, uh, how to navigate oneself. And I'm interviewing colleagues who are career coaches, life coaches, and other professionals on their suggestions and feedback. Today's guest is a dear colleague of mine. Her name is Gloria Sinibaldi. Gloria, welcome to the Global Advocate Career Podcast. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here again. I want to say that we had some technical glitches before a full confessional. And Gloria, I thank you for doing this again. I appreciate your support. Welcome to the Global Advocate Career Podcast Coffee Corner with a Career Coach. It's great to be here. <laughs> oh, it's great to have you, Gloria. Uh, but first, before anything, do you have your coffee cup? I do have my coffee cup. Mm -hmm. What does yours say? It says rise and shine, which is very appropriate because what's the first six steps towards success? To show up, right? Ooh, I like that, Gloria. You see, dear audience, how Gloria is ready to impart her knowledge. Thank you very much for that. I think we should all have rise and shine cups. <laughs> um, but Gloria, thanks again. May I read a mini bio about you? Sure. Excellent. Gloria Sinibaldi has coached clients for over 20 years, dear listeners. Her tenure with California's Employment Development Departure, EDD, Department, excuse me, in San Francisco Bay Area introduced her to a wide range of job seekers, including professionals, dislocated workers, youth, and special populations. She was instrumental in launching Fremont Success Center at the Family Resource Center, where she trained groups of long-term unemployment job search skills. As coordinator of ProNet, a job club of 250 professionals from Silicon Valley, she earned EDD's Sustained Superior Accomplishment Award. She's published numerous job-related articles and A Means to Survive, a short story about the struggles of the unemployment during a recession. She currently lives in California with her husband, Ralph, and Airedale Terrier Little Bro. <laughs> Gloria, that's fantastic when you hear your bio and you listen to your accomplishments and what you're doing now. How does it make you feel? It makes me feel very good. I, I, um, I'm happy with what I do. I feel good about, you know, the help that I can give to others. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud that I've, I've come this far. Now, when did you decide that you wanted to become a career coach? Well, you know, I didn't know I wanted to become a career coach. I obviously got into it when I began working with the Employment Development Department, and there I was fully immersed with all kinds of people in need of help with coaching, uh, along with unemployment insurance and other different needs. But going back before then I myself was searching and I myself was in a position where I didn't really know what I wanted to do I actually started out as a cosmetologist oh, wow. and I did hair and I did all of that um, but it wasn't my calling and I knew it I did it for a period of about seven years and, um, and then I stayed home and took care of my children for um, a period of time and it was during that time that I realized myself, as well as a lot of other stay-at-home moms, were trying to get back in, in, into the job market. And um, th that's when I kind of became a little bit interested in, in finding jobs and that sort of thing. But I found myself at the unemployment office when I got laid off from my first job. And I like to tell my clients this story because it's kind of a networking story that I didn't even realize it was networking at the time. But before I left, after I filled out all the papers, I just said, hey, are there any jobs working here? And that was kind of my, I guess you say, aha moment of beginning my, um, my work as a career coach. Because once I got into that position, I knew that I was in the right place. You said a few things there that I believe we as coaches in, encourage with our clients. First of all, seizing the opportunity. 
right? Determining um, what's around you and that you can tap into. What, what motivated you to ask that individual if there were any positions there? Like what made you think outside the box? <laughs> it's really funny. It was almost like it was, um, like I said, an aha moment. I thought, I, cause I was really kind of shy about it. And I remember struggling with myself, like, no, that would be a dumb question. And, and it was like, I had this devil and angel, but the, the little angel said, do it, do it. And the devil said, no, no, <laughs> just keep it. and I just said, I just, I just asked because I kind of liked the environment of a big office. I felt a good vibe in the office, even though the EDD office where people file claims isn't exactly the happiest place all the time. But I, I just kind of recognized there was a lot of opportunity there for me to, to help others. And that appealed to me. That's right. That's right. I think that, um, first of all, you thought out of the box, you took a risk and you followed your instincts. And I think this is something that we, I, I certainly like to share with my clients. And I think it's great that you demonstrated that. Um, I also wanted to piggyback on something else you said about aha moments. This is something that we strive for as coaches with our clients. Can you tell us what your definition of an aha moment is? Well, my de definition of an aha moment is when you kind of know something all along, but it's just not sticking. There's, it's kind of bouncing around in your head and you can't really formulate what it is and then all of a sudden it's like there's a realization that gives you a place to put that thought and a place to take that thought and take action on it so that to me is an aha moment so gloria let's talk about your background a bit you worked um, as a civil servant yes i did and um particularly in helping individuals and training them to be more, uh, how can I say, marketable in the workplace, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. What would you say would be like the top three areas where you saw there was definitely a need uh, to improve in one's skills? Well, the first area is to um, show up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, get a, you know, a plan, get organized, get, um, uh, get, it's set in your mind that this is what you're going to do, this is what you want to do, and this is your goal. But really, I think an overriding theme of most job seekers is they lack confidence. They right. lack a lot of confidence, and they have a great deal of difficulty speaking about themselves it's almost painful for them to do that and i have found that no matter how accomplished they are how many degrees they have how much past experience they have especially women mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to kind of tamper that down and and not speak um to promote themselves to market themselves and that's that's one thing that uh, that needs to be worked on pretty much across the board um, and then like I had said, also mentioned before um, people that have overly confidence overconfidence you you'll often meet people that say I really don't need any help I I'm, I've got it all together my resume is perfect and I, I've never um, had to well, I've had so many people tell me, I've never had an interview. I've just always just been offered the job, and I, I don't have any problem with it. Or people that say, I've never been turned down in an inter interview. Wow. <laughs> I know. Wow, that's... <laughs> I know. That's pretty awesome, right? I'm like, wow, that's amazing. But if you delve a little deeper, you find little cracks in that armor and there is always room for improvement and once you get the communication going with that individual i think to have the time they end up benefiting from at least one little thing that you can share with them and i think uh it, it's helpful yes i agree i think um i, I 
I was having a conversation with one of our other colleagues, Samantha Petrie Quillen, and we were yeah. talking, right, talking about how um, people don't, people shouldn't consider career coaching when it's an emergency level, right? Mm -hmm. Can you go into your thoughts on why um, an individual should consider coaching um, when everything is going right in their career, you know? Well, for one thing, you shouldn't wait till everything is going wrong, like Samantha said, because it's kind of like exercising a muscle. You got to keep it going. You got to keep it working, because if you leave it not working when you need it, it may be kind of weak and it may not work so well. So, um, you know, that's true. Of course, we're talking about networking and keeping your network alive and good and intact while you're in a, a great job. But um, I think we all benefit from a little bit of mentoring, a little guiding, a little um, help from our friends, or from our coach in this case, um, just to have somebody to bounce off ideas, yeah. to um, practice, you know, interviewing or take a look or second or third look at our resume. I mean, not just that, but just, just that moral support is very, very important. And that, that uh, is true, whether you're having a you know, success, successful career even in the moment or especially when you're feeling lost um, and not able to, to get to your goals, then you, you really need that extra help. Yes, yeah, I agree, I agree. What would be two signs for, uh, that someone should look out for if uh, that that would indicate that they they should really consider getting a career coach like what what would you see say that for them to probably start experiencing or well i, I think if you start isolating yourself you're in trouble <laughs> and i think that that's a common thing that happens to people um when they become unemployed i think they almost don't even realize it's happening they're so used to getting up and going to work every day yeah that suddenly they don't have to do that and oh maybe i'll just go over here and do this and that um mm -hmm. and not really their wheels aren't aren't turning and then they're kind of slipping away and not not getting out there and, and rubbing el elbows with people um when you're unable to well it's kind of the same thing in a way motivate yourself when you're not organized when you're um you're feeling confused about how do I tackle this monster they call unemployment? What, where do I go? How do I organize my day? Some people are having, they have trouble, um, you know, organizing themselves. They're used to going to a job where they know exactly what to do. Somebody yes. Organizing them, but it's harder when they have to do it for themselves. Right, right. I, you know, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, you had and I had spoken about the fact that we're both civil servants, right? I've done it on the city, state, and federal level. Um, I believe the workplace is changing, though, would you say, Gloria? Whereas individuals will take on a position and, and anticipate. I know my mother was a civil servant for the city, so she was in her job for over 25 years. We don't see that anymore, do we, Gloria? Gosh, no. I think the average job is, what, about three and a half years or About so? that, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely not. Um, I think the millennial generation has changed that quite a bit, and maybe it's, it's great. I mean, I, they're always looking, everybody should always be looking for the next opportunity. Um, and no, back um, before, if you didn't stay in a job long term, you were, you know, what do they call a job hopper? Right. <laughs> and job hopper wasn't good. You didn't want to have that label. <laughs> but mm -hmm. now it's it's not so bad. And but it's a different workforce out there too. I mean, it's not a nine to five world out there anymore. People are working weekends, nights, um, and with the technology. It, you know, every time your watch buzzes, you're sending an email, making a phone call. So it, it's a whole, it's the blending of work life and family life is getting more and more uh, prevalent. Yeah, definitely. I think that this isn't, 
being that obviously millennials are now flooding the workplace and individuals such as baby boomers and uh, Gen Zers, no, excuse me, Gen Xers are, are getting older in the workplace, right? I think the expectation is, is that um, of this permeancy in the workplace, and we just discussed that that's not happening anymore. What would you tell someone that's sort of in that place where maybe they think they're going to write it out for another five to seven years in the same position, and um, that may not be the case? How can they handle it safely? <laughs> <laughs> navigate it yeah well I think it's all a mindset I I don't know that you should set your mind to I'm gonna stay in this job for X amount of years because I you know you always need to have your eyes and ears open you always have to be open for um, new opportunities you may not want to move you know, when a new opportunity comes out. I mean, there's so many people that don't like to move around. They just want, they want to just stay. They're comfortable and that's good. They're not trying to become, you know, CEO or whatever. They just want to stay in their job and that's okay. But so often those jobs go away for one reason or another, you know, the, the economy has a slump or they move elsewhere to a different um, city. That's actually what happened to, to my job is, um, when I ended up at the EDD, they yeah, sure. they cl cl closed up shop and moved to Santa Rosa, which, which was too far for me to go. So I, you know, I wasn't able to go along with them. I actually really like that job, and that happens to a lot of people. Yes, it happens to a lot of people. So, to me, it's all about mindset. In fact, life is all about expectations. If you expect to t stay somewhere and then it doesn't happen, you're going to be really disappointed and I you're, going agree. Be, you're going to be hurt and you're going to be worried and you're going to be this and that you know what do they say um plan for the worst but hope for the best i mean you know <sighs> yes yes and i suppose that's quite um timely right now considering that we're dealing with a pandemic um yes. what are your thoughts <laughs> what are your thoughts about that i think this is um possibly going to um, give employers reason to consider more remote positions, not just in this present time, but even going forward, because, you know, we seem to be in a different sort of place, you know, where new things are popping up. I mean, yes. so we never know, even after this coronavirus, maybe there's going to be something else. So, and then there's the climate change situation with too many cars on the road and all of that so remote work I think is becoming a lot more attractive to a lot of um, employers and to a lot of families and people too yes. I mean, um, so it's kind of a win-win um, in this current situation there could be a slump I hope not it could be a temporary slump or it could be something a little worse than that. I mean, we did have a terrible stock market uh, week last week, and I think it might be a little bit of this week. <laughs> they, said got, they said it got a little better. Yeah, they said it got a little better, but still. Yeah, but still, uh, people lost some money, and and um, employers pay attention to those things. So we, you know, that's just another reason to, because I have worked through many recessions or several and uh, some worse than others. And I tell you, you have to be competitive. It's not that you're not hired. Uh, it's not that there's not hiring going on. It's just that the, re the resume stack that was like this is like this. And it's not just that. That's just getting your foot in there. You, you have to be very, very competitive. And so your muscles, like I was talking about earlier, they have to be strong. I agree, I agree. I remember the last recession, I actually, um, I was, uh, I lost my job. I was in politics at the time and my boss did not seek reelection. And to be really quite frank, I didn't know what to do next. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons why I became a career coach was to help others get ahead of that feeling of loss and not take, not being in the driver's seat, right? 
um, we tell that to our uh, clients all the time, don't we, that they're in the driver's seat. Right, right. And speaking, they are in the driver's seat. I mean, I think that's, again, applied to life. We all are in our own driver's seat. and We've got to make sure we're going in the right direction and have the right mindset to get there. Um, but it's, it's a good point you, you brought up about loss because job loss is, it's grief. It's, it's grief just like any other type of grief. And um, it's difficult. I mean, that's definitely, a, a, you know, a good reason why somebody should have a, a career coach because if they're alone, if they're a single parent, if they're whatever, you know, so it causes a lot of stress in families and marriages. And so, you know, having a, a, a person as your advocate when you're going through that tough time is, um, I think it's a great benefit to many. It is. It is. The fact we are advocates, and I'm glad that you raised that. And it is a loss. I, goodness gracious, my most recent experience was very challenging for me. Um, but, you know, it, you know it's, it's like a muscle you haven't used in a while. You're like, all right, let's, let's get it working, right, Gloria? And so you demonstrated that yourself in your career transition. So tell us about you as a coach now. How has, how has that worked for you um, in your family life? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, everybody asks me, you know, advice. <laughs> what about this? What about that? Um, oh, gosh, it's, a, it's evolved over time. Um, I spent a lot of time with unemployment insurance in the, in the last part of my career. I heard so many um, horror stories about people got fired. It's not funny at all, but I mean, yeah. I should have written a book because uh, it's quite amazing. But um, I, I just I just helped so many different types of populations. I helped you know people that hadn't had jobs in in 25 years. And wow. then, I mean, I had one lady was 25 years. I had this one group. It was for the welfare to work program. I, that was the most amazing of 16 people in this group, many of them long-term unemployed and the, and the character, I mean, you couldn't make it up. And every single one of those people got jobs, every single one of them. I mean, and they were, they went on TV because of it. <laughs> <laughs> they even did a little TV program because really it was um, the Family Resource Center and it, we were, it was marketing how you know this jobs program was working so well. And then I worked with the Silicon Valley professionals, um, whole different uh, skill set, a whole different group of, of people that helped each other and, and um, lifted each other up. It was it was quite an amazing experience but as i went forward um i enjoyed the fact that once i retired from the edd i started writing job search articles in the newspaper and i got such a positive response from that and that's that's kind of how i launched my own personal um business is through that job um, search article that I wrote and it was it was during a time it was in 2011 for about six years right. so that was when I got started with um, meeting people through that just asking for help I, I wrote all different kinds of articles. I think that's fantastic you took what you did before right mm -hmm. and you applied it and talked about it and found opportunities through it. And I think that, right, it's, 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 you wrote about your experiences and your perspective and opportunities came from that. I think that's fantastic. Well, I kind of, I, I have to say I am really kind of proud of that because, um, well, what I saw, it, it started because the editor of the newspaper in my local town said, I we want um, ideas for articles. And there was so many people out of work and I, I, she, it was a coffee chat, just like this. She goes, if you want to come down to so-and-so coffee shop. So I met her down there. And I said, we really would need an article in the paper about 
you know, job search. There's so many people. The unemployment in, uh, it was in South Lake Tahoe was extremely high. And she goes, well, who's going to write it? And I said, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Never done that before. And I drove home thinking, oh, my God, what did I just say I was going to do? But it was one of the best um, experiences. I mean, and, and so many people responded uh, positively. So um, that was kind of a little bit of a, I've always loved to write. So it wasn't like it was something like, oh, my God, I can't do it. But I just had never considered that she would give me the opportunity to write it. I, I did. She go, okay. Yeah. It, it's kind of an example of, um, well, networking for one thing, but it's an example of um, reinventing yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So transferable skills, I mean, what kind of things that you did before can you transfer into what you can do now? So, um, and there's so many transferable skills that people have. Uh, they just need to give it some thought and figure out what they want to do, what they like to do. Um, so that was my little example. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think, now, question, when you spoke to that uh, editor, were you employed at the time? I had just retired. My son was ill, and he um, required that I leave my job earlier than I would have uh, normally. So when I left that job, I was, I was feeling a bit lost myself. I really wasn't ready to retire. So I did work two other jobs. I worked uh, for high school teaching special education students how to write resumes and do interviewing skills. And I worked in the county in the One Stop uh, Employment Center as well. And I had just left that position because, um, well, it's kind of a long story, but because of my retirement, I couldn't only stay for a sure. long time. I couldn't, you know, there were requirements. Uh, and so that's right. Right after that was when I um, did the articles for the Tahoe Daily Tribune. It was all around Lake Tahoe, and then it was on the internet. So, so I was like, "Wow, I'm famous." <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think I, I asked because it's right in the moment of transition that sometimes we get our best inspirations, um, and I think you demonstrated that. Right? I think this is something that we want that I definitely want to emphasize to our watchers and listeners that it's during that moment of uncertainty that you can suddenly become certain. I always say, strike when the iron's hot. And the iron hot can apply to how you, you have to have a, a passion, a little bit of a fire in you, you know, that, oh, this town has got a high unemployment. Oh, I have these skills that I can help these people. And I love to write, click, and went down and talked to Kim. <laughs> it's like, you know, and it all just came into place. But, you know, I think there's a higher power looking out for all of us. At least that's the way I feel about it. So, um, hands down, hands down, Gloria. I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, I, I think I, I firmly believe in a higher power. And I, and I believe, to, you know, just to break it down a bit that when you pursue your goals, when you determine at least something, what you want, things work in your favor, right, Gloria? Yep, yep. Well, it's, uh, we are what we think, and that's why we have to think positive. It's more than just stay happy. It's more, we are what we think. If we think what we can do it, we can. And that's the truth. And that's the truth. I can attest to that. You can attest to that. I know, you know, if someone's watching, they're saying like, oh yeah, this is, oh, okay, this is one. No, it's true. I know. Well, that's an aha moment, sort of. I mean, you have to feel it. But when, when you know it's true, like you and I do, and I'm sure many people out there and beyond do know it's true, but you got to feel it. You got to feel it. You have to trust yourself, trust your instincts, and believe in yourself. And it'll happen for you. It will happen, Gloria. I really, really believe that. So how can, how can watchers, listeners get in touch with you if they want to utilize your services, talk to you, say hi? Um, okay, well, you can contact me through my website. It's called getajob.com. Okay, <laughs> I like that. 
<laughs> two T's and two B's, that's G-E-T-T-A-J-O-B-B.com. Or you can just message me through LinkedIn on my messaging through LinkedIn. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So where do you see coaching going in the future, Gloria, considering all these changes that are happening right now? I think it's going to be more prevalent. I think more people are going to seek it out. I'm not sure that people even knew job coaches existed <laughs> before. It's that we're coming out of the shadows. Um, <laughs> I like that. I just had a vision of me just coming out with a gown on. I'm a career coach. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, I you hear more about it now. Same with life coaches, right? Which life coaches are different than uh, like therapists. You know, they're they're slightly different. So people are becoming more aware. People are, I think, reaching out more. People are becoming more open to new ideas. Um, so I think that uh, us career coaches are gonna, you know, do just fine. I agree. I agree, Gloria. I agree. And I thank you for taking the time out. Part two to do this again. Um, thank you for having me on. I really yeah. appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Will you come back and tell us how you're doing? And um, for our listeners, you know where to reach Gloria Sinibaldi. She's on the West Coast. That's why she's looking, it's looking so sunny over there. And she's looking so relaxed. Um, but thank you, Gloria. Thank you, dear listeners and watchers, until the next episode. Thanks so much. Thanks, Gloria. All right. Bye-bye now.